Yes, 12 years introducing speakers and, uh, oh, and my husband is still in the front row giving me hints and <laughs> I forget things. So good morning, everyone. Gosh, it's so nice to see you. And I am honored to introduce today's speaker. But first, it's time for this. Please turn off your cell phones. We don't want to have her interrupted. <sighs> Thank you. I'm sure you've already read a bit about Kelly. So you know that she is Ottawa and Potawatomi. She is a citizen of the Machibanashwish tribe. Uh, you know, the people halfway to Grand Rapids at the Gun Lake Casino, same, same group of people. Um, she's from an unbroken line of basket makers, and that is a line that is, stretches back quite a long way. She is concerned with tradition, with telling stories, with environment how we are stewards of the land, lakes and rivers, creatures, plants. Kelly's basket weaving tells stories about her life as a culture bearer, a serious and glorious task. All of the things she does begin with her family and their teachings. Kelly earned an AFA degree at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, and then her BFA at the University of Michigan. Her work has been exhibited at the Smithsonian's Renwick Gallery and recently the Grand Rapids Art Museum, among others. And I hope she'll tell you some of the exciting places where she's just told me about where her things are being shown. Along the way, she has been honored with fellowships and numerous other awards. She teaches her craft and traditions to support future generations, bringing centuries old knowledge and craft together with new ways to expand understanding issues of our Michigan communities. And today she has graciously brought examples of her work that are up here um, for you to see up close with social distancing, please. So it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Kelly Church. Thank you much, Barbara. Um, Anya Nishna Kelly Church in Dishnikaz, Hopkins, Michigan, the Dojibo. What I just said is, hello, how are you? My name is Kelly Church and I'm from Hopkins, Michigan. Today I wanted to start uh, with a little story about when my grandfather passed away. So when my grandfather passed away, we took him to the Salem um, uh, Cemetery out there in Salem Township where we're from in Allegan, Michigan. And when we got there before the internment, my dad stood up. And he said these words, you are on Indian land. And so I start this today because we truly are on the land of Machibanashiwish, my tribe that I am from. This three mile square here in Kalamazoo was part of the original reservation of my people. So um, our, our state is really unique and that it has all Anishinaabe tribes in this state. So in this state, wherever you go and you see some native um, imagery, some native language, some native history, or um, native culture, it will be Anishinaabe. And the Anishinaabe is the Potawatomi, the Ottawa, and the Ojibwe of Michigan, which is also the Chippewa that you would hear. So today I will be telling you about my family. As Barbara mentioned, we are an unbroken line of basket weavers. We go back before this country existed. So these teachings that we have today have been carried on since pre-contact before um, when we were the only ones here in this country. And then we carried these through. Now we've carried these traditions through many, many hardships, many times of trying to um, you know, uh, punish it out of our children, but we have sustained these traditions up until today. And that is where all of my teachings come from. The past where we began, um, I speak about stories of today and share my voices of who I am as a Native person living in today's culture and today's world. And the things that I like to speak about will affect our generations of tomorrow, which is something that we all need to think about. Um, the only thing I should have asked Maya is, what button do I push? <laughs> okay. So this is my family in 1919 in Allegan County. Um, if you can see, there's like 
the little girl on the ground with the basket, she's holding it and smiling so pretty. Well, right behind her, there's those women. There's one, two, three, four, five women. Those women are my great grandmothers and they're the ones from Salem Township. You'll see a little tiny baby in between the legs of one of the women. Um, actually, there's two babies, a little girl standing in between the two women and then the little boy, he's holding onto some wood. That is my great grandfather. Now, this picture we just happened to find in the house once. I'm like, Grandpa, who are these people? He's like, oh, that's my mom, and that's me, and so we could date it. He knew he was two years old. It's from 1919. It's during the last pandemic that was here. So it is at a, it's a very um, opportune picture that we can show from the last pandemic until now. Luckily, our families um, sustained. Not all of my family did sustain during this pandemic. We, uh, people were lost then too. A lot of Native people were lost back then, you know, but our community here was really, um, you know, they hung around themselves. So they were secluded within themselves. So I think the social distancing was more um, community wise and not, you know, told wise. So, but in the lumber camps, a lot of people were lost and that is where a lot of the hardships came from. But we have been weaving these baskets for thousands and thousands of years. So those four, um, five sisters passed on the teachings to everyone. And so the one with the little boy is Sarah. Um, she married a church. The other three to the left married pigeons. If you guys have ever heard of the pigeon name and baskets, we are all related. So when in Allegan County and Hopkins, I usually tell people I'm related to everyone but one family. <laughs> Now this is a black ash tree and this black ash tree I harvested. This is one of the last ones that I harvested downstate in Michigan because we have this issue with the emerald ash borer, which I will speak about. But this is a black ash tree. When we're looking for a good basket tree, we are looking for a tree that grows straight. And what I mean by that, it's not just it is growing straight, but notice the bark on the tree. The grain is growing straight on that tree. That is one of the um, identifiers of a good basket tree. So black ash trees are the tree that we're actually looking for. It grows in the swamps and the wetlands. Um, it can be harvested any time of year. We try not to harvest in July because the bugs try to carry us out. But if I need wood in July, I will break those bugs. And um, But the fall and the spring are the ideal times. The sap is running behind the tree. Things are re regrowing, renewing. And one tree like this can almost carry me throughout a year. So when we go into the forest, we're not taking tons of trees. We're taking one tree and we're utilizing it as far as we can to um, make baskets. So when you harvest a black ash tree, the outer like eight to 10 growth rings are um, spring wood. The inner growth rings are heartwood and they're dark. It's all beautiful wood. So this is what I do. I take people's kids from them. I'm kidding. And I'm like, hey, who will give me their kids? But literally, we've been taking our children into the woods when they're little kids. And um, I love the last time that I harvested with my cousin John down at his tribe in Pokagon land. I call it Pokagon land, but down at the Pokagon tribe. Um, we went into the woods there and he had his little three-year-old grandson. And so when the men were getting ready to carry their logs out, they cut him a little twig, probably about this thick, about this long. And he put that on his shoulder too and carried it out of the woods. But that's how we've been teaching. We have been teaching visually and orally for thousands of years. Do we have the ability to write it down and put it in books? Of course we do. Do we have the knowledge and the ways? Of course we do. But we have our oral stories that have been passed on for thousands of years for this reason. Because when you do not record your oral stories, then you are forced to pass them on and tell them so they will continue. And that helps your oral teachings pass on. A lot of our history today is kept in history books. And how many of you know your full history? Probably not. You know why? Because somebody wrote it down and kept it safe for you. You feel safe with it there. If you do not write down your oral stories and your oral teachings, then you have nowhere they're kept safe except for up here. And this is how we pass on our stories to make sure they are continued and passed on. We choose not to record them and write them down so they will be continued and passed on and remembered. And our way has always been teaching orally. 
So I love this one if, um, oh yeah. So this is my husband pounding. When we pound on the log of a black ash tree, like I said, we're going to harvest that tree first and we'll be checking the growth rings of the tree. While the bark has to be straight, the growth rings also need to be about the thickness of a nickel. We'll lay down some sema, which is tobacco, and we give thanks to everything around that is offering that tree. And we're letting the tree know what we're going to use it for as well. We're not just like, you know, hey, I'm, I love this tree. I'm taking it. We're, we're asking that tree and we're sharing with that tree what it will be shared with. It will be passed on for new teachings, new memories with new children, and the teachings will continue. So we offer some tobacco, we harvest the tree, and then we carry it out on our shoulders because we're in the swamps where you can't drive. Then when we get home, we begin pounding on that log from end to end, about six to eight feet, about, um, the, about two inches in width is about the width that we will do. Now we're doing it with an old, old ax. When these axes, we like to go through any of your garages that you have an old ax, just call me, I will take it off your hands. Because old axes that people can't use are the ones that my grandfather had in his garage. The back's all rounded out. It's not sharp anymore on the edges. It's not purposeful for what we do today, but for pounding it is. I could not go to the store and buy a brand new ax because the edges would be too sharp. So the edges on old axes have kind of rounded edges. They're about an inch in thickness in the width. You need to pound very hard like you're chopping wood and you need to overlap every single one of those inches. So you're going down a six to eight foot log about a half inch at a time. So it is an arduous process, but it is a labor of love. And um, you have to have a really strong husband as well, which I do. His name is Jeff and he's in the front. He's pounding this and you'll um, hear how beautiful it sounds. Oops, wait, let me go back. Okay. Oh, I might not know how to do it. Let me do it one more time. I'll try. Okay, there we go. There. Oh, the volume is not there. So I don't know how to turn up your volume, guys. But what you see what he's doing, the pounding. That is really important to see. That is very hard work just to pound that hard. So when he pounds, he's pounding as hard as he's chopping wood. This noise will resound around our neighborhood about a quarter mile, a half mile down the road. Sometimes we'll check and see how far it resounds because we might get up. He used to get up and go to work early. So he might get out there and start pounding at 6 a.m. And you want to know who you're waking up. But we live by farmers and they're up earlier than us. But the farmers did ask us one day, are you guys putting in a well? Because they would hear that pounding all the time. So it would have been like we were putting in the slowest well ever, like for years and years, you know, pound, pound. Oh, they're doing it again today. <laughs> it's like, no, no, we have a well. We're pounding on wood. So then I gave them a basket so they could see what we were actually making. But I call this pounding the heartbeat of our black ash basket. It's what gets the, um, our growth rings off of the log. And as he pounds, it separates the fibers in between the growth rings. So each growth ring will release and pop up. When we go into the woods, black ash trees grow 20 to 40 feet tall, and then they Y out. So they grow very straight and tall, not all, all of them straight, but they grow very tall with no branching, which makes it suitable for basket weaving. So when we go out to the woods, we have to identify our tree. I can always identify a tree by the bark now, black ash bark. So if I go to the woods today, you know, when I first started out, I would, you know, is that white ash? Is that black ash? Is that elm? The elm is the only thing that still fools me a little bit. So I'll look to the top. Our black ash trees in the winter on the left will have these little tiny leaf buds that are black like chocolate chips. That is why it's called black ash, Fraxinus nigra. I think it's the scientific name, black ash is easier to say. And then on the right side are the summer leaf buds. And if you notice it has one stem and no stem for the little leaves coming off and they are right across from each other. There are no other leaves that do this. So we know it's black ash when we harvest and there's normally seven to 11 leaves. So between the straight bark and that identification, that is what we're taking our kids in the woods to learn. After Jeff pounds on that, 
and I will, I'll, I'll be cued every now and then in pound two, but um, I can do it about 19 times. I've literally counted like 19, my arms feel like they're going to fall off. He'll, sometimes I make him videotape and he'll have to do it for five minutes straight. <laughs> so he, it really is an acquired um, strength skill, but you can only do what he's doing right now if you've pounded hard enough. If you've not pounded hard enough and you go to pull up those splints and they do not pull up easily, do not pull them up. We're not forcing that growth rings to come up. We are releasing the growth rings from what we've already released with the pounding. And then on the right side is the growth, uh, the growth ring inside a splitter. This is how we will split that growth ring apart. It is very rough on both sides. And when we stick it in there, we can score it and split it in half just like this. So it's about the thickness of a nickel, a coin nickel. I will score it with a knife. I can literally see that it is splitting, you know, that it's uh, split apart when I score it. And then I will peel it apart. And if you can see that, the inside of the growth ring is so smooth and shiny and silky. It's just beautiful. So the inside of the growth ring becomes the outside of our baskets and the outside of the growth ring becomes the inside of our baskets and we will shave those in the outside growth ring smooth. So when I get done, that's a big pile of ash, what it looks like on the floor before I start turning it into baskets. Now, these are some finished black ash creations, traditional things that we have done forever. Our cradle boards, um, one time I, my daughter uh, got the end of her finger cut off not cut off like it was a really bad cut though and when she got to the hospital when she was two because she was a little girl um she wasn't fussing a lot but they're like hey we're gonna put her in a papoose board is what they called it i thought that was so cool that the hospitals literally had these because they're calming this is something for a child when they're sleeping you're working in the uh blueberry bushes once I, you know i took my daughter out to the blueberry bushes you know when they're snuggled up and um they feel good you know how babies like that little snuggle but when our babies are out there, they're observing. So this is part of that visualization process of learning. So when our children are even babies in their little cradle boards and they're all snuggled up and snuggled in, they're still watching what we're doing and they are learning and they will emulate by picking up that stick later and sticking it on their shoulder and walking somewhere. On the right side is an all natural ash basket that is with, made with the all natural um, growth rings and without any color. So like I said, there's the spring wood, which is a little bit whiter, and the heartwood, which has a tan look to it. These are some um, more baskets that we use traditionally. On the right side is a market basket. So that would be something that, you know, as the markets came along and we were not hunting and foraging for our food and we were buying some flour and sugar and all of those, uh, I call them white foods that are bad for you. I'm diabetic, so... Um, flowers and the white sugars and all of these things. But that's what we would go to the market with. And this is what we should use today. You know, it's something that's great and you could go there and it's recyclable, but um, they're so sturdy. So if we make a market basket, I used to have this huge fat cat and it was about like 21 pounds. I don't know. It was really big, but we could put it in the basket and a few other things too. So these market baskets are very sturdy. We also use them for carrying our babies around as well. And they had drop handles. So they would carve these handles that would fall down to the sides. You could pick them up and carry your baby around. So here in Michigan, we had baby baskets and our market baskets. On the left, our strawberry baskets um, represent, of course, that healing food that we all have. But our strawberries are also very special to us in many ways. We do ceremonies with our strawberries when our girls come of age. They abstain from strawberries for a year, and then they share strawberries with the community. We also have, when our people pass away, I get asked to make a lot of strawberry baskets, and they'll go into the casket with our loved ones when they take their journey. And my father passed away the, during the pandemic, so his ashes, my father and my brother actually, their ashes will go inside strawberry baskets, which we will bury into the ground, which will you know, dissolve with the earth and we'll all become one again. So um, strawberry baskets are really important to us. I'm asked to make them for graduations, for weddings, funerals. It's a really significant basket to our people. So this is what we have been up against since 2002. 
Now, 2002, the emerald ash borer was discovered in Michigan by the researchers at uh, Michigan State University, but it had been in our state since 1992. So tens of thousands of trees were dying in Canton, Michigan. The researchers from uh, Michigan State University went in to see why all of these trees were dying. The bark was peeling off. It had been 10 years of this infestation coming in. So these bugs came in to untreated ash pallets into the port of Detroit on, um, from ships from Asia. They're a very, very hardy bug. So we have shipping treatments that uh, before you can ship stuff, you have to heat it, you know, or you have to freeze it. So the heat is 140 degrees around the United States. You heat stuff and then you'll ship it. 140 degrees. These bugs can survive 140 degrees. So they are kind of like, I like to say, like the cockroach. They're a hardy bug. Now, we can't even freeze them out in Michigan. You know, sometimes we're always so hopeful. Oh, it got so cold. Remember when we got like 20 below a few years ago down our way? And, you know, like this, you know, cities were closing down and how amazing that was. And you go outside and you take a breath and it takes your breath away. Well, that didn't even kill the emerald ash borer. It needs to be a sustained temperature of 30 to 36 degrees below zero for a few weeks before that emerald ash borer will die. So we're talking like places up maybe Augusta, Maine, um, you know, the T International Falls, Minnesota, places like that, you know, where their furnaces run all winter long and never shut off. Those are the kind of places the bug will perish at. So this is in Brighton, Michigan on the left. We were um, fighting this emerald ash borer. First, we were discovering it in 2002. Native people probably were learning about it, you know, 2003 or so. The DNR wasn't aware that we made baskets out of trees. And then we hadn't really worked together with the DNR in a lot of things, just to let them know, hey, we'll be in the woods as these families and we'll be harvesting trees. So that is as far as it, it went. But with the emerald ash borer, I was doing a presentation up at uh, Michigan State University with a basket weaver named Anna Crampton. Now, she was a basket weaving family that came from one of those that was a forever weaving family. And she was telling about her baskets while she was weaving. I was her announcer, so she could weave. And I'm like, this is Anna Crampton. She was weaving baskets out of black ash. And so I do this little spew. And then this lady came over named Deb McCullough. She was one of the researchers that discovered the bug. She said, do you use ash for your baskets? Do you know about the emerald ash borer? And at that time, I did not. And so that is how I met Deborah McCullough. We came, um, we're really good friends now. I like to say that um, if you could be fan of an entomologist, I am her number one fan club. I learn all I can from Deb about the Emerald Ash Borer. If I have a question, she will get back to me. She will share the information. And from here, I disseminate the information to other Native nations and um, anyone who's willing to listen. <laughs> so, so I love talking about the bug. On the right side in 2009, we were harvesting up in Elk Rapids. I was teaching kids. This is what I do, teach the younger generations to continue the traditions. We harvested a tree, and you can see the gallery marks in those um, growth rings. We pounded out a set of growth rings, those gallery marks. That little bug, you guys, is no bigger than the head of Lincoln on a penny. He bores out of bark that's like a quarter inch or more in thickness. It can bore out. I've never seen its you know, tentacles or whatever it bores out with, but he's so strong. He also, when he's a little guy, before he becomes the beetle, he's a larvae, which is about an uh, inch to an inch and a half long, and that will girdle the tree. So it goes through all of the growth rings, the cambium layer, it's eating all of the nutrients from our ash trees, and it makes these gallery marks. I was so um, just astounded that it went through. The last little spot I could see through those galleries was on the sixth growth ring. So it is really a hardy larvae and a hardy bug for being so small. It has devastated over 500 million trees in Michigan. Our mitten is nearly decimated of all of our taller trees. Um, there has been some treatments in different places going on. So in Rochester, Michigan, right off the bat, they started treating all of their ash trees on their streets. 
with the ash treatments, which were pretty expensive, but they had the money in their city, they're still living today. So um, some of these ash treatments do work. It's called uh, triazin and triage. So these are the two ways. One is more biochemical and the other one is more chemical. So um, I prefer the um, triazin, which was made in Canada, which is more biological and natural ingredients. But the triage does have a very effective percentage rate of 95% or more. You inject into the bottom of the tree and then it will um, go throughout the tree. And when the bug comes, it will kill it. So seed collection has become one of the most important things. Now, every time I harvested a tree, we would plant some seeds. And so those were always something very important to do. You harvest, you plant. And, but then we began to see that the emerald ash borer would eat something that was like an inch in diameter. Now, if an emerald ash borer is going for seedlings, then we need to save those seeds. So we began studying and um, I began learning from the seed collectors. And there was a, a group in Aquasosny Nation, um, Les Benedict and Richard David. They have been collecting ash seeds for 20 years or more. So they already knew about all of it. Cherish and I, which is my daughter, we went out to their nation in 2003 just to learn about seed collection. Little did I know about, I would learn about the Emerald Ash Borer in the next year, and this would become one of the most important things we can do. The black ash tree only seeds every five to seven years. The white ash tree seeds every year or two. So now imagine every five to seven years we can get seeds, and we have to watch it you know, watch it to make sure that we don't miss those seeds when they come because they come so few and far in between. The emerald ash borer can destroy an entire ash stand in three to five years. So we are literally up against a little tiny bug to harvest these seeds and to make sure we get them. So now if we see a tree growing that's just beautiful and straight, it has the perfect growth rings, but it is a seeding tree. We will not take that tree until we can get the last seeds off of it. So um, storage of these seeds can be stored for 25 to 30 years. Up in Canada, in Montreal, they have a seed bank where they've stored them for 30. Here in um, the United States, we have Fort Collins, Colorado, which is our seed bank, and they have studied them to store for 25 years. So different nations have been collecting seeds, sending them to Fort Collins, Colorado. Some nations have been keeping them in freezers at their own tribal um, places so they can replant them in the future. So this is still one of the most important things we can all do with any tree because we've already gone through the elm dutch disease where we lost all of our elm. And then we replanted a bunch of ash. Now we lost all of our ash. So what some things we need to think about are diversification when we replant things, let's replant indigenous plants. Indigenous, remember that word. Plants that were already here, let's replant those plants and let's plant some maple, let's plant some elm, let's plant some ash, let's plant some oak, but let's not plant all one species. So um, things can continue to thrive. And the ash seeds here on the left, you see those little tiny white things in the background? You see here on that picture, I was focused on my little buds, but in the background, that little like ball is a flowering, um, is gonna, it's a, I call it a, a seed flower. It's going to turn to seeds later. So in April, May, about May time, we'll start seeing that trees flower and trees will not flower unless they're gonna seed. And then they will turn to those seeds later and all of the seeds will release. They're not mature until about the end of August, September, around the beginning of October. And what happens then? All of our storms. So it's like us against the storms. It's like, ah, stormy day, let's go try and collect as many seeds as we can. But again, they have to be ready. So the, when the seeds mature, after you collect, let's say 10 pounds of seeds, only about two pounds of those seeds will be viable in the end because there's also um, seed grubs, little grubs that eat seeds as well. So you're always up against some kind of pest, but that's just nature. You know, nature, um, only the strongest survive with the seeds. So this is what I do. I tell stories through my work. I take, I start in the past with these traditions. So um, is my work traditional? It starts out in the most traditional way. I harvest a tree and I use teachings that have been passed on for thousands of years. 
And then I weave things and tell my stories and my voice today. So today I tell a lot about the Emerald Ashboard, which the basket on the left represents. And I always do it in green with copper. And copper is um, the purest copper in the world, comes from the Great Lakes region. We had float copper from up here in the Great Lakes. And so the purest copper in the world comes from the Great Lakes. Our people were some of the first metal workers. We utilized copper. And so, but that's not why I put copper in there. I put copper in there because the emerald ash borer's belly is copper colored. So it is an emerald green bug with a copper belly. So what I'm doing is using the colors from the emerald ash borer. I'm sticking inside of an egg. And uh, we're all familiar, or if you're not, I'll tell you about it. Fabergé eggs. I'm sure most of you have heard of a Fabergé egg. I call these Fibergé eggs because I make them all out of fibers from the forest. So um, at the top, there's a little bit of sweet grass holding the tops and bottoms together. And then the green and the white are black ash splints. And then I add the copper in. When you open this up, it will have uh, uh, some kind of story or a vial inside. This particular one will have a black ash seed and an emerald ash borer, which I actually have on the table and you all can see it after come up and view those things. So the emerald ash borer is so, so tiny. But it, when I used to carry around just a normal basket, put a bug in there, you know, you go around and you want to just share your story about your bug. I used to share it so much that when my sister, I, she lives in Florida, I saw her one year. She's like, hey, how's it going? I'm like, good. She's like, you're not going to talk about the bug, are you? So, <laughs> so she already knew about the bug. But yes, I did share about the bug a lot. I will carry a bug in my purse. If someone wants to know about the Emerald Ash Bar, you give me two minutes, I will, I will just fill you in on that bug. So, But when I used to carry around normal baskets, like a pencil basket or something, and have the bug in there, you know, you start talking about a bug, everybody's eyes will glaze over. But if you have a beautiful basket that intrigues people, and then you tell them how it was made, and then, and then you open it up like, well, why is that bug inside that beautiful basket? So it gave me more of an opener. You have to give them, I, I feel, I like to joke, you have to give people something really pretty to look at or shiny, and then they'll listen to the rest. So that is how I started doing my baskets to tell our stories um, about our water today, which I have on the table. I have one of my Fibergé eggs, and that one is about our water here in Michigan. So um, you can't drink money. So in one, I have water from Lake Michigan, and the other one, I have a $20 bill. And it's like, you decide what you want to drink in the future. But it's not our decision just for us what we want. It is not just our decision. It is for future generations as well. So sharing the loss of our trees, the one on the left, you can see it's starting to turn into a copper basket. We're starting to lose our ash. We can still carry on our weaving methods, but we will need other materials to do that with. So this one is called traditional transformations. I'm showing how our traditions are being lost to the emerald ash borer by putting the copper in there. On the right side is a checker game, and that is some white cedar frogs. And those are black ash frogs, and it's called the... Um, habitat, the fight for habitat, because our trees are fighting for survival in our woods. And the more that we encroach in the woods, the less woods they will have. Luckily here in Michigan, we have that wonderful UP. We do um, protect a lot of our national forests, which I'm really pleased about here in our state. And um, being able to harvest in our national forest is something that our natives can do through our treaties. And so we're still stewards of our forest and they are looking as well as they can be despite the emerald ash borer and the other invasive species coming in. Oh, and the checker game. In the middle row, if you see those two colors, that is not dye. That is the heartwood and the springwood. So that's the two natural colors of the ash. Now, in the springtime, we have, um, we have two to four weeks out of the year when the sap is running. That is when everything is regrowing, renewing. All of our, you know, daffodils are just coming up, um, you know, pretty soon. Our tiger lilies and everything will be coming. So this is when the bark will peel off the tree. So we don't harvest just for the bark. We're harvesting for the growth rings. But this is just an extra basket we can make at this time. 
So we will get the log. I will always slice a little bit and see if the bark is peeling at this time of year. If it's not, it's just not. We have to chip it off to get to that pounding. But at this time of year, if we can take the bark off, we can slice the knife down to the end, put our hands behind it and peel it apart. So I was up at the Grand Traverse Band teaching them this picture I loved. It was one of my favorite ones. It was the whole community working together. You can see those young children. You can see the grandmother. You can see the, the um, middle-aged people. I think I see Jeff's hand right there at the very front. So he's showing them all how to take this bark off. And so this is how we teach, and this is how we learn intergenerationally. Um, we learn together, and you learn firsthand. So these baskets on the right side, um, I was into a Star Wars face, so that has Yoda on it. It says, may the forest be with you. <laughs> and this is one of our most important teaching tools of the future because our bark is the first thing destroyed by the emerald ash borer. When um, we, all our trees are gone, remember 500 million trees are gone in Michigan already. We have uh, approximately 803 million ash trees in Michigan. I'm sure there's more than 500. I've been saying that number for at least eight years. So those bark baskets are going to be very important because the emerald ash borer destroys the bark first. Now, when we go into the woods, I identify my bark first. So when we replant these seeds, we have to wait for them 20, 25 years to grow before we can harvest them. We need to know what the bark of the tree looks like. So these baskets, which we say are very easy to make, you know, if it's that time of year, you're slicing down, peeling the bark off, and you're shaping them. But we can only make a few a year at that certain time of year. So to me, they're our rarest basket because it is a certain time of year. We're not harvesting just for the bark, and the bark is being destroyed by the emerald ash borer. So to find a tree with bark these days is really rare. So these will become important teaching baskets. I hoard them like um, a hoarder. I have about 30 at my house, but I um, plan on giving them to the future generations so when they replant the seeds, they know what kind of bark to look for. Oh yeah, so I have to do this. So we can, oh, so we can all contribute to the health of our environment by first recognizing it for the life-giving sustenance that it provides and taking it apart for carrying it with a small ax, big or small. We can all collect seeds. Pine cones are on pine trees. Everyone sees a seeding tree, collect those, send those to Fort Collins, Colorado. We can plant seeds. We can clean the neighborhood, drive less, walk more, stop using pesticides to making our lawns beautiful, um, protect and conserve water. Protecting our water is gonna be one of the most important things we can do. If you do not have water for seven days, we will die. I mean, literally, we're just going to be dead. You cannot drink money. Money is temporary. No job um, should ever come over clean water. So that pipeline five needs to just go. I think we did a lot of things back then without thinking about future generations. It was all about the time at the moment. We need to stop living in the moment, and we need to think about the past, the present, and the future, and most especially the future. If nothing else, just look at a small child as five and think of what you can do for them in the future when they are your age. You know, um, I would say uh, almost 50 years from now, I'm going to be 55 this year. So 50 years from now, I look at a five-year-old, I'm like, what can I do for them to make sure they have clean water 50 years from now? Um, these are sweet grass creations. So as we lose our ash, we are beginning to we recognize, reorganize, um, remember our traditions that we um, practiced uh, more frequently than we do today. And we also want things that are sustainable. So sweetgrass is one of our most sustainable um, materials that we can use because you can plant a plug or two of sweetgrass. It will propagate into a nice big bed and you can harvest it. We use it for our basket bottoms. A braid of sweetgrass is so strong. When it's dry, I can just break it right apart. When I get it wet, it um, I can go like this, and you can hear the twing in it. Little twing, twing, kind of like a guitar string. And But when I wrap all of those together and braid them together, then they become even stronger. So I like to say our sweetgrass is just like us, like people. When we're alone and we're all dried up without water, we can die. And I can break you because, you know, sweet gas is all dry and it's just going to break. When we have a little bit of water, 
we are given that life and then we become stronger with that sustenance and our bodies are 60% water. So as you walk around, you know, and people are like, oh, this is water weight. It's true. You know, <laughs> I'm 60% water weight. So, but then when we braid those together, just like all of us today in this audience, all of our knowledge together, all of our collective work makes us stronger people. So these are birch bark creations on the left side. This is a winnowing tray, has a sweet grass in there, has black ash, white cedar bark. These are different materials we harvest. We will winnow our um, wild rice. We will winnow our corn. And when you winnow it, it means you stick it in there and you shake it back and forth. And those little tiny see-through husks that are on corn and on rice, they kind of just fly off into the air. And that's what we're doing. We're winnowing it back and forth, trying to get that off you know, and they also, first they dance on it with moccasins with the wild rice, and then we'll winnow the little um, shucks off. On the right-hand side is a birch bark biting. I did that with my eye tooth. And so we do birch bark bitings. They used to do them for like quill work patterns, for symmetrical patterns under quill work, beadwork in the future. They also did it um, at strawberry picking time. This is when our birch bark is the right time to pick it. And so um, my grandma said when she loved it, when she would pick blueberries, because her dad would give her a stick of gum. But really, that was just to keep her from eating the blueberries, right? Mm -hmm. So if you take a break from strawberry picking and you're biting on bark, you're not eating your blueberries either, or your strawberries either. So it was a good pastime, but it's also a tradition that not a lot of people practice anymore. I'll be at Western Michigan this week, actually, um, sharing with the community on Wednesday. So... Um, the birch bark biting, um, they did like a survey and it was less than 12 in North America. But I always like to tell people, those are 12 that you see. Those are 12 that you know. Those are 12 that came out of their house and said, hey, I do bitings. I'm sure there's more, but um, those are 12 that they could identify. So this here is one of my new pieces from the Grand Rapids Art Museum. And this one is called Blood Memories Are In Our DNA. Now, in American Scientific Journal, they had an article, and it was about um, how if your grandfather didn't like cornbread, someone in the future generations is not going to like cornbread. It, blood memories is a real thing. It's not just something natives say, oh, I got blood memories, I can make baskets. It's in our blood. So these teachings are in our blood, and at our boarding schools, they tried to take the teachings away. So while my grandmother was being punished for these teachings, um, my grandfather did not have to go to the boarding schools. His family was continuing the teachings. And then my dad came along and my grandmother said, I didn't want to hold him back so I didn't pass on the language. So there was this hesitancy with my grandfather or with my father's generation. My generation, uh, the non-native people of this United States chose not to share our native history and history books, which is a not good thing. But for a native student in schools, if you don't know your history and how you were, you know, persecuted, genocide, um, you know, your grandmothers were punished and some of these um, atrocities that happened to your people, then you're not, a, you don't have that memory. So I do not have those stories from my family. My dad was a historian. We went to Mission uh, Fort Mackinac. He would say, hey, Pontiac overtook this fort. So, you know, I learned about my native history from our native people. It made me a stronger person. So we have that generation of my grandparents being um, punished for doing their culture, my father not being taught it for that reason. And my generation is coming along. We're hungry, we're starving, we want it. We're gonna take it, we're gonna share it, and it's gonna be here. So this is one of the things that I did in this piece is show we still have our black ash, we still have our sweet grass, we still have birch bark. And it's done in the shape of a DNA, um, how DNA looks in our bodies. And the orange hands are all of our kids from the boarding schools that they tried to take it away from them. They kept it. My grandmother went to the boarding school. She was beat for doing these things. But when she went home, her father said, you do not speak English here. We only speak our first language, was which was her Anishinaabe language she was born with, and she still practiced her own ways. So this is how we retained it. So we never lost our ways. And so I love to share that, um, that today um, we are uh, 
um, strong and we're able to take these teachings from the past to share our stories of today, just like I'm able to do with all of you. So during the pandemic, of course, I made a lot of masks because masks was very important and it's still important today. My father passed away two weeks before the first shots came out. That was devastating for me. I have to say I can, I can talk about it easier today because I believe our loved ones are always with us. It was um, hard not to be with him physically, but I know he's here today. And so all of our, um, our ancestors are still looking down over us. And that gives me the comfort that I have now. But I have to tell you, during the pandemic, you could have said that to me and I would have not believed you and I would have not been comforted. It was a hard thing. So I started making masks because masks were something that um, people were, you know, I don't need a mask if I don't think about anybody else and I'm just thinking about myself. I can't breathe in a mask. You know, it's like, yeah, you can just breathe. So, um, so really, um, it was something that became really important for me to share. Um, this is my daughter, Cherish Parrish. She makes body baskets. So when she was 17, she made her first body basket. It won the competition here at the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. And she was one of the top three um, high school students um, in 2007. So that was her first body basket. Her art teacher knew she made them at home and said, hey, you can do independent study, make whatever basket you want. She didn't make a pregnant one that year. She made pregnant ones after that, showing how our baskets, we are carriers of culture, but we are also women and carriers of the next generation. So they have a lot of significance to them. And um, she's really well known. And that is all black ash. And those strips are like an eighth inch thick. They're just intricate baskets. And so this is a painting. I started out as a painter. I like to show this to people because it is um, the top right is native people. Down below is non-native. And on the left is everybody else yet. So I like to show that we are all the same on the outside. We are all the same on the inside. On the outside, we look different. And that is what we need to remember. It doesn't matter what we wear, what we look, what we have. On the inside, we all have hearts. We all have blood. We all have, you know, our, our minds, our thoughts, our feelings. And so we are all the same on the inside. And this is a seventh generation black ash basket. This is made out of vinyl blinds and ribbon. It is to show that if we don't take care of our trees and seeds today, that we will be able to pass on our traditions of tomorrow, um, the weaving ways with different methods, but we will not have that black ash tree. 75% of the work I do is processing and harvesting that tree. So I'm losing 75% of a teaching that has been sustained for traditions and it will only be able to carry on 25% of it. So we are collecting seeds, we will replant them. I tell little kids when I work with them, when I'm gone, I will want you to plant the seeds. I'm kidding, but I will just be like, plant the seeds, plant the seeds. So I'm trying to get that subliminally in your head right now. So all of you will say it too later. Collect seeds, plant seeds, we can all have a part. And so miigwech, that means thank you. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for letting me share. I love sharing. I love talking about the bug and all of her traditions. And um, everyone is welcome to come and look at here. And if anyone has a question, I would love to answer it for you. Oh, yes. My husband's heard this so much. Those bangs were him kicking the water bottle over when he fell asleep. <laughs> and if, you, if anyone has a question, and if you don't, then I always feel like, boy, I was good. I covered it all. <laughs> so, <laughs> and please feel free to come up and look at anything. I have items up here made out of birch bark. I have black ash. Um, some of them have white cedar in them. The one with the butterfly on it is a half male, half female butterfly. I call it the emergence of we. Back in uh, the actual real teaching in the boarding school, to take the out of the Indian and replace it with I. Because we're very community oriented and they wanted to replace it with I. So I call this emergence of we. And it's half female and half male butterfly, which they call rare and beautiful. 
We also have two spirit people among our um, people, which are, you know, uh, maybe a male who has a female heart or a male, uh, female who has more of a male heart. And there's seven different ways that can go. So I always like to joke that um, it can it can also be, um, you know, someone who thinks of themselves as female or just acts more that way. So my daughter and I were real tomboys. We might fall into that spirit group, but we um, have our special people, but we have all of us. I see male and female in this audience as well. So we have all these um, identifiers today of who we are, but I like to say we are, we are one all together. Then I also have one of those bark baskets up here if you want to touch it, see the thickness of that bug has to go through. The bug is on the right side inside a vial. Please come up and look at him. And there's also a black ash seed up here. So you're all welcome to look at anything. And well, yes, David? One, uh, are there any species of the ash family that are more resistant to the animal ash borer? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the second question is, when you look at the grow things, you know, uh, a dry season or a cold season gets a tighter, darker ring. Is there a difference in the way you process the darker uh, rings of the bark to the angle from the way you the Um yes. So the first question, um the first remind me one more time. Uh, they, different, different species. Oh yeah, different species of ash. So the first question was, do, are any species of ash more resistant to that emerald ash borer? And that's a great question. The black ash species is the most susceptible to the emerald ash borer, and white ash trees are less susceptible, but they still will get killed. But here in Michigan, 99% of our ash trees are dying. 1% are living. Let that be your, you know, your cup half full. That 1% are normally our white ash trees. So they are more susceptible. Now he asked about different seasons of growth, a dry season and a wet season. Yes, yeah, so that will affect the growth of the um, growth ring. When I'm checking the growth ring, I notch into it. I'm looking for the thickness of a nickel. If it's a drier season, those um, growth rings won't be as thick on the outside. They'll be a little bit thinner. It wasn't getting as much water. And so I'm only harvesting the trees that are thick enough. So there might be a different place. Like maybe the UP will be a little bit more of a drought than somewhere else that may have gotten more water. And I, I know I live in Allegan County, so people would be like, ah, she says that because she lives there. But no, some of the most beautiful ash used to come from Allegan County because we have a lot of swamps in Allegan. So it's one of the main places all of our native people lived and then they started to go to where they are today. Allegan County right below us in Kalamazoo, these are swampy areas. These were great um, places that nobody wanted to live in until they were cleared. <laughs> so, so we were like, yeah, we have everything here. But yes, uh, we will, um, we don't pound on anything different from the, the spring wood to the heartwood, but we won't harvest the trees unless they are um, thick enough. Does anybody else have a question? Yes? Do we work with the heartwood? Yes. So there's some weavers that prefer only the outer growth rings of the wood, and then they might use it for firewood or something. My cousin, John Pigeon, taught me to pound that growth um, ring down right until you cannot. Sometimes your log might split. And then he says, put a screw in it and screw it back together and keep pounding. So we will utilize every single part of that growth thing that we are able to, to make those baskets. And that's, that's what I was saying. We can get a lot of wood out of it. Um, some people don't prefer the darker color of the growth ring. They don't think it's beautiful, but you saw what it looked like in that checker game. It's a beautiful color. And if you don't like the brown, you can always dye it blue and black, you know, dye it some beautiful colors. No, I actually do sell my baskets. So um, I, I'm really good in the woods and horrible on computers. So I hired a web person who, you guys, I'm really bad on computers. She's literally waiting for me to send her some pictures to put my store up. So if you go to my store on my website, which is up there, woodlandarts.com, it has just a bracelet right now for sale, and that's it. But there will be bitings and different things by the summer. Once I send her pictures, she'll add them. But that is where I sell my stuff. I never did this before because I did not have internet till the pandemic came along because I live in the woods. And then we got satellite 
And my dad says, oh, that's what they give people up in Alaska in the rural areas. So I live in one of those areas where you could just only get Hughes.net. Nobody else would service us. And um, so I get sketchy internet where if I did a Zoom with you and you asked me a question, this is what I do after. <laughs> I sit there for a few seconds, I hear your question, and then I answer. So I look like I'm purposely just... <laughs> but yes, I do have a website and please visit it anytime. And if you're interested in something, I encourage people to email me because sometimes I'm just off on a tangent loving what I'm making. But if you like, want a strawberry, say, hey, you got a strawberry for sale? I will make one. So. I think it would be really nice if you told these people the, the places that oh, yeah. acquire your work and they will be able to see it in, their, in the museum. Okay, so yeah, so this was an exciting year. You think the pandemic was home and you know, like nothing, I'm not teaching or doing anything, but during the pandemic, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Renwick Gallery, purchased um, one of my Fibergé eggs. So it will be on display opening May 13th for a year. They acquired 135 new pieces during the pandemic and shortly before. So 135 of the 150 pieces will be on display this summer. So I will have one of my Fibergé eggs there and it relates to our black ash traditions. Um, the Art Institute of Chicago renovated their American art gallery and usually there's the American Art Gallery, who half the museum, what, three quarters, 90% of the museum. Then there's the Native American Gallery. I call it the closet gallery because usually you have to find it, it's gonna be small and it's not permanent. It will be, you know, pieces on rotation. American galleries are permanent exhibits. Like the um, Edward Hopper's Nighthawks is so permanent that when I look for the um, Art Institute on a map, his painting comes up specifically showing where it's at in the museum. But I bring up his painting because they rehung it from the center of a gallery into the rice wing in the American gallery. And so they put his artwork up with an African-American artist on one side and a woman artist on the other side. They're including Native American art and I was so thankful to be one of those Native American artists. So I was joking with Barbara in the beginning, if you look at my egg, my egg is in the same room as Edward Hopper's painting. So if you look at my egg in the case and you stand right here, you can see my egg and you can see his painting behind my basket. So it's all about perspective, you know, where you're standing and who's behind who. But anyway, you guys, um, they showed me a picture of that gallery and there was like 20 people. He goes, oh, you see that well where all the people are? That's Edward Hopper's painting. This is the curator from the museum. That's Edward Hopper's painting. Everyone comes to see it. And my egg is before. While people aren't crowding around it, they have to walk by it to get to Edward Hopper. <laughs> it will be viewed. And then the Field Museum, I'm really happy to announce, is um, renovated their great hall. It used to have little, you know, uh, pieces that you would find in your field, you know, the arrowheads and stuff like this. Very archaic stuff. Native American art is like in with natural history stuff, but we are here today. So they're starting to renovate their museums. This great hall has been renovated. They've made it into contemporary artwork that will open uh, May 21st. And I will have a Piper J. Egan there relating to Lake Michigan. And that will be on permanent display and well as well. So in Chicago, they're, they'll be up forever in DC. Thank you for asking me to show you that. <laughs> Please come up and enjoy. And miigwech. I like to say bama p to everybody. That means I will see you again someday because we don't have a word for goodbye. We'll always see each other again. I think I am.